Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> what a great, great crew. Good morning. All right. We're getting there. <laughs> One more try. Good morning. All right. Welcome. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Greater Naples. Those of you who are sitting quietly, those of you who are still deep in conversation, it's great to have you here in this small gathering. You should all come closer. It's, it's, a, it's an intimate setting here this morning, uh, the day after Christmas. My name is Tony Fisher. I am grateful to serve this congregation as its minister and grateful to be here with you this morning. As usual, I, I love to uh, welcome and thank those who helped make the service possible this morning. We have Ken Hartman in the AV room substituting for Daniel Goodsit. And uh, up to the challenge, I'm sure. Uh, he was with us on Christmas Eve. Uh, Abby and Sean are with us again to provide some wonderful music. We thank Anna for her, her marvelous ability to pull everything together on, for Sunday morning. And uh, also the, the folks in the kitchen for brewing the coffee and uh, putting out the cookies for us later on. That's really something to look forward to. So this morning, we also welcome uh, some members online from the congregation in Gross Point, Michigan. Uh, many of you know Ann Roberts, who's a member of the music committee and a longtime member with her husband, John, here. Uh, they are uh, attendees in Gross Point uh, during their time up north, and since there wasn't a service scheduled there this morning, uh, she invited the congregation to join us online, so welcome to you wherever you are. It's great to have you with us. Uh, we give you a warm welcome, not only from the heart, but also here in Naples where it's going to be about 80 degrees uh, early this afternoon. So uh, we know that it's just about freezing up there in Gross Point, so we're our thoughts are with you this morning. I'd invite uh, Janet Hoffman up to share uh, an announcement about an upcoming event that uh, is very important. I'm Janet Hoffman of the Team Against Racism and Oppression, and we are hosting a workshop beginning uh, January 13th that will be for four sessions. Uh, it is being facilitated by Reverend Ann Dunlap, a National Social Justice Coordinator for Showing Up for Racial Justice. And uh, it will have four parts. We recommend attending all four, but you can do one or any number of them. It's the history, of, uh, the history and roots of policing, faith traditions, Imagining Community Safety, and Where Do We Go From Here? And I'll have a clipboard out on the pavilion after the service for you to sign up, or you can sign up on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, uh, I'll be participating in that workshop and we'll be introducing this subject in services early in the month. So I urge you to look into it and sign up if you will. If you're visiting us for the first time, I don't see anybody in the sanctuary maybe that's doing that, but perhaps online you found us here, so welcome. It's great to have you with us. Uh, I hope that it, you will make yourself known in the comments section below the video box on Facebook Live, or uh, please do send an email to office at uunaples.org, and Anna will send you out some information and keep you up to date on all the things that are happening here at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Greater Naples. So, let's take a deep breath. We'll say hi to the folks out on the pavilion. Great to see you out there as well. We haven't mentioned you yet, so good to see you. And let's settle into our time of worship with this morning's prelude.
Give us the spirit of the child, the child who trusts, the child who imagines, the child who sings. Give us the spirit of the child, the child who receives without reservation, the child who gives without judgment. Give us the child's eyes that we may receive the beauty and freshness of this day like a sunrise. Give us the spirit of the child. Please join me in the chalice lighting response on the screen. Give us a child's ears. And now let's join Sean and Abby as singing our opening hymn. It's number 254 in the gray hymnal, or the words will be on your screen. We'll sing verses 1, 4, and 5 if you're in the hymnal. But again, the words will be right there. Sing we now of Christmas. eight years since I've been here, we've established a little bit of a tradition uh, where if a Sunday falls very close or on the holiday of Christmas, we share a story on that Sunday, uh, knowing that there will be a few good souls gathered here and perhaps a few more online in their jammies with their Christmas presents around them. We've shared uh, uh, Truman Capote's A Christmas Story and A Child's Christmas in Wales and The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry. Today we'll be sharing a story written in the late 1800s by Henry Van Dyke called The Other Wise Man. I was raised on stories, Winnie the Pooh and Alice in Wonderland and all those wonderful tales and learned from them uh, as I think many of you did as well. Perhaps not the same stories, but rich stories from our childhood, which were teachers in and of themselves. Being uh, raised in Lexington, Massachusetts, there was also a lot of history uh, surrounding the town. And, and one of the poems um, that uh, we learned early on was by uh, the Unitarian Henry Wadsworth Longfellow about the midnight ride of Paul Revere. And I can still recite that pretty well, not completely, maybe. <laughs> 18th of April in 75, you know, so forth. Longfellow also wrote a poem about the three kings, and it, it starts like this. It has the same sort of feeling as the midnight ride, which is what, what caught my attention. Three kings came riding from far away, Melchior and Gaspar and Balthazar. Three wise men out of the east were they, and they traveled by night and they slept by day, for their guide was a beautiful, wonderful star. The star was so beautiful, large and clear, that all the other stars of the sky became a white mist in the atmosphere. And by this they knew the coming was near of the pr prince full foretold 
in prophecy. The poem ends many, many, many stanzas later. <laughs> then the kings rode out of the city gate with a clatter of hoofs in a proud array. But they went not back to Herod the Great, for they knew his malice and feared his hate and returned to their homes by another way. The kings, the magi, the wise men were always an interesting idea in my mind and, and brought mystery to this birth, which was mystery in, a, in itself. But again, the stories evoked something sort of ineffable in the listener, the gift of these magi and their appearance and the star. And so this morning we ask, during this dark time, we ask which stories will carry us forward and what star will we follow into an unknown future. Let's join together for our centering hymn within the shining of a star, number 238 in the gray hymnals, if you're there. of you who are visiting us online, this is our time to lift up our hearts and minds uh, for someone who we're thinking about, some person, even ourselves, who we're hoping perhaps for a brighter year ahead, as all of us are, uh, but we take this opportunity to speak out a name uh, here in the sanctuary and out on the pavilion, and I hope uh, those of you who are watching at home will also do the same thing an opportunity to express verbally, out loud, a name and have its energy echo in the air around you and around us. So I invite you to share a name this morning of somebody you're holding close. And I'll start over here. Thank you. I know that we all share the memories of family, friends who have departed, and hold them close this time of year, remembering perhaps those times shared. I think of those who told me stories who are no longer with us, and how rich that experience was. And I know I share that with all of you. So. A special thought goes out to the storytellers this morning. And also, as always, those who are fighting on the front lines of this pandemic, which never seems to go away. Let's deepen into a time of meditation. Why Not a Star by Margaret K. Gooding. They told me that when Jesus was born, a star appeared in the heavens above the place where the young child lay. When I was very young, I had no trouble believing the wondrous things. I believed in the star. It was a wonderful miracle part of a long-ago story foretelling an uncommon life. They told me a supernova appeared in the heavens in its dying burst of fire. 
And when I was older, I believed in science and reason, and I believed in the story of the star explained. But I found that I was unwilling to give up the star, fitting symbol for the birth of one whose uncommon life has long been remembered. The star explained became the star understood for Jesus, for Buddha, for Zarathustra. Why not a star? Some bright star shines somewhere in the heavens each time a child is born. Who knows what it may foretell? Who knows what uncommon life, yours or another's, that may yet again unfold if we but give it a chance? They told me that when Jesus was born, a star appeared in the heavens. Let's share a few moments of silence together.
In the days when Augustus Caesar was master of many kings and Herod reigned in Jerusalem, there lived in the city of Ecbatana among the mountains of Persia a certain man named Artaban, the Magi. His house stood close to the outermost of the seven walls which encircled the royal treasury. From his roof he could look over the rising battlements of black and white and crimson and blue and red and silver and gold to the hill where the summer palace of the Parthian emperors glittered like a jewel in a sevenfold crown. Around Artaban's dwelling spread a fair garden, a tangle of flowers and fruit trees watered by a score of streams descending from the slopes of Mount Orontes and made musical by innumerable birds. On this night, however, all was dim and quiet. High above the trees, a dim glow shone through the curtained arches of the upper chambers of Artaban's home, where the master of the house was holding counsel with nine friends of differing ages, all Parthian nobles. As the fire rose, it cast a bright illumination on the assembled faces and throughout the whole apartment, re re revealing its simplicity and its splendor. With cautious excitement, Artaban was telling his friends of the study he and three other magi had made of the ancient writings and of the stars that indicated the time had come for the rising of a victorious one. There shall come a star out of Jacob, he recited, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Most of his friends were skeptical. The tribes of Israel are scattered throughout the mountains and like lost sheep, one said. And from the remnant that dwells in Judea, under the yoke of Rome, no scepter nor star will rise. But Artaban pressed on revealing more of the signs that he and Caspar and Melchior and Balthazar had discovered. If the sign appeared that night, he, he would travel, he said, as quickly as possible to the temple of the seven spheres in Babylonia to meet with the three and the caravan they had assembled to take them to Jerusalem. Artaban asked his friends to go with him on that pilgrimage in order that they might too find joy together in finding the Prince of Peace who was worthy to be served. He explained that he himself had sold much of his possessions and bought three jewels, a sapphire, a ruby, and a pearl to carry them as tribute to the king. The sapphire blue as the fragment of the night sky, the ruby one redder than a ray of sunrise, and the pearl as pure as the peak of a snow mountain at twilight. Many of his friends said, it's a vain dream, Artaban. One bade him good wishes, but said that as guardian of the royal treasure, he could not go. And still another said he could not leave his new family nor bring them along. Finally, his oldest and most loving friend said, Artaban, it seems that none of us will travel with you, but you, you must go. You must follow your heart and the signs. Remember, those who would see wonderful things must often be ready to travel alone. Go in peace. So when all his friends had departed, Audubon went out to the roof to observe the stars, and far over on the eastern plain, a white mist stretched like a lake. But where the distant peak of Zagros serrated the western horizon, the sky was clear. Jupiter and Saturn rolled together like drops of lambent flame, about to bend into one. And as Artaban watched, behold, an azure spark was born out of the darkness between the two planets, infinitely remote yet perfect in every part. It is the sign, he breathed. And before the sun had begun its journey across the sky, the other wise men 
was in the saddle of his swiftest horse, Vazda, riding to meet the caravan and his friends. He knew he must travel well and wisely to arrive at the appointed point to meet the other magi. Fifteen parsangs was an absolute most that he could push his horse to travel in a day. And at that pace, he would reach the Temple of the Seven Spheres just before midnight on the tenth day, the appointed place and time. Through the fertile fields of Konkobar, among rich gardens watered by fountains from the rock, over many cold mountain passes and down many black mountain gorges, past Seleucia, which Alexander built, across the swirling floods of the Tigris and the many channels of the Euphrates, he traveled. Both Artaban and his prize horse were almost spent as they arrived at nightfall on the tenth day beneath the walls of populous Babylon. He would have turned into the city if he could have to give himself and Vazda a rest and some food. But the rendezvous was at midnight and he could not spare the time. He pushed Vazda on. Not too far along the road there, the horse Vazda passed into the shadows of a grove of date palms and as she was aware of the darkness, she slowed her pace and began to pick her way more carefully. Near the further end of the shadows, caution seemed to overtake the horse, and she sensed some difficulty and danger and came to a complete stop. The grove was close and silent. Not a leaf rustled. Not a bird sang. Vasta stood with every muscle quivering before a dark object at the side of the road. Artaban dismounted. The dim starlight revealed the form of a man lying across the road. His dress and outline of his face showed that he was probably one of the Hebrew diaspora who still dwelt within, with great numbers within the city. Artaban felt the chill of death in the man's hand, and as he released it, the hand fell limply back under the breathless chest. He turned away with a thought of pity, resigning the body to that strange burial which the priests and the magi deemed most fitting, the funeral of the desert, where vultures and varmints would pick the bones clean. But as he turned, a long, faint breath came out from the man's lips, and the bony fingers closed on Artaban's hem of his robe. Artaban's heart leaped to his throat, not just from the start, but from the dumb resentment at the inopportune timing, the possibility of delay to his destination. Surely he must stay here in the darkness to minister to this dying stranger, yet, yet if he was delayed for even an hour, he could hardly reach the meeting place in time. He would have to give up his journey, his quest, as soon as it had begun. His spirit was in turmoil. Should he turn aside, if only for a moment, from following the star to the, give a cup of cold water to this stranger? He took a de deep breath. God of truth and purity, he prayed, direct me in the holy path, the way of wisdom which only you know. Artaban's indecision was truly only momentary, he turned back to the sick man, loosening the gris grasp of his hand, and carried him to a more comfortable location at the foot of the palm tree. Assuring first that he was comfortable, he brought water from one of the small canals nearby and moistened the sufferer's brow. He mixed a drink with one of those simple but potent remedies which he carried always in his girdle, for the magis were physicians as well as astrologers and he poured it slowly and carefully between the colorless lips of the man. Hour after hour he labored as only a skillful healer can do, and at last the fever broke, and the man opened his eyes in wonder and looked up. Who are you? he said. I am Artaban, the Magi, and headed toward Jerusalem, but found you here. I'm in search of one who's to be born king, a great prince and deliverer of all people. I cannot delay any longer in my journey. I, I'm sorry. Here is all the bread I have left and the wine 
and a potion of healing herbs. When your strength is restored, you can find your way home. The man raised his trembling hand to Artaban and said, I have nothing to give you in return for what you have done. Only this, that if you seek the Messiah, if it, that is who you are seeking, I can tell you the prophets have said he will not be born in Jerusalem, but in the city of David, of Bethlehem. May the Lord bring you safely to that place. It was already past midnight when Artaban rode towards the temple of the seven spheres. The great horse, restored by its brief rest, dipped into its remaining strength and fled over the ground like a gazelle. But even so, it was the first beam of sunlight that struck the temple before Artaban arrived. He quickly looked around, hoping that he might see the caravan either close by or on its way, but nothing was to be seen, no sign of the caravan or the wise men. At the edge of the highest terrace, he saw a pile of broken bricks under which was lying a piece of parchment. We have waited past the midnight hour, the parchment said, and can delay no longer. We go to find the king. Follow us across the desert. Artaban's shoulders sagged in despair. I cannot cross the desert with no food and a spent horse. I will have to return to the city, sell one of my jewels, and buy a train of camels and provisions. I may never overtake the other three. Only God, the merciful, knows whether I will lose sight of the king because I have stopped to show mercy. We take a little break. This congregation, too, has its own story, one that is vibrant and ongoing. I hope you'll take some time to show your feelings for this place and this community and all that it does and means. This morning's offering for the ongoing mission of this congregation will be gratefully received. If you're with us online, the information you need to donate will be on your screen. Star. 
So Artaban the Magi did return to Babylon, and with his sapphire, he purchased what he needed to make the journey and set out once again. Through heat and cold, Artaban, priest of the Magi, the fourth wise man, continued steadily onward, crossing the desert in starkness in its wonder, arriving finally but still full of hope in the city of David, Bethlehem, bearing yet his ruby and his pearl gifts for the king. As he searched for the place where the baby lay, he was aware of the desolation in the streets. All was eerily quiet. From an open door of one low stone cottage, he heard the sound of a woman's voice singing softly. He knocked and was greeted at the door by a young mother hushing her baby to rest. She told him that three wise men had indeed appeared in the village days ago and how they said that a star had guided them to the place where Joseph of Nazareth was lodging with his wife Mary and their newborn child. And she told how they had given many rich gifts to the child to honor him. But she also shared how the travelers had disappeared again as suddenly as they had come. And the man of Nazareth and the babe and his wife had fled away that same night secretly. And it was whispered that they were going far away to Egypt. Ever since, she said, there's been a spell upon the village. Something evil hangs over it. They say that the Roman soldiers are coming from Jerusalem to force a new tax from us. And the men have driven their flocks and herds far back among the hills to hide themselves and escape it. The young mother laid the babe in its cradle and rose to care for the strange guest. She set out food for him, what little food she had, graciously offered and gratefully received. A little later there came suddenly the noise of wild confusion and uproar in the streets of the village, a shrieking and wailing of women's voices, they have come for our children, they cried. The young mother's face grew white with terror. She held her child close within the folds of her robe, praying that he would not wake up and cry and give them away. Artaban went quickly without thinking and stood in the doorway of the house, his royal bearing, filling the opening, blocking any sight of the home within. The soldiers came hurrying down the streets with bloody hands and dripping swords. At the sight of the stranger in his imposing dress, they hesitated with surprise. Artaban did not move, but said in a low voice, I am alone in this place, waiting to give this jewel to the prudent captain who will leave me in peace. He showed the ruby, glistening in the hollow of his hand like a great drop of blood. The captain barely hesitated, but stretched out his hand and took the ruby gleefully. March on, he cried to his men. There's no child here. The clamor and the clang of arms moved on down the street. Artaban re-entered the cottage. He turned his face to the east and prayed, God of truth, forgive my sin. I, sin, I have said the thing that was not to save the life of a child. And two of my gifts are gone. Shall I ever be worthy to see the face of the king? But the voice of the young woman, weeping for joy and the shadow behind him, said very gently, Because you have saved the life of my little one, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. So the fourth wise man set off once again and traveled from place to place and finally to Egypt and then from place to place again, searching among the people of the dispersion. He saw hunger and famine, plague-stricken cities, imprisoned and enslaved. In all the morass of humanity, he found none to worship but many to help. 
He fed the hungry, he clothed the naked, he healed the sick and comforted the captives. And his years went by far more swiftly than the weaver's shuttle through the loom, leaving behind a pattern of love and compassion. It seemed almost as if he had forgotten his quest. Before what seemed the blink of an eye, three and thirty years of the Magi's life had passed, and he was still a pilgrim and a seeker after light. His hair, once darker than the cliffs of Zagros, was now white as the wintry snow that covered them. His eyes, which once flashed like flames of fire, were more like embers smoldering among the ashes. Worn and weary, his time on earth nearly spent, but still looking for the king, he had come at last to the, for the last time to the city of Jerusalem. He had often visited the holy city before and had searched its lanes and crowded hovels and black prisons without finding any trace of the family of Nazarenes who had fled Bethlehem so long ago. But now it seemed as if he must make one more effort. And something whispered in his heart that at last he might succeed. It was the season of Passover. The city was teeming with strangers and many languages. But on this day there was a singular agitation visible in the multitude. The sky was veiled with a dark and rolling gloom. And Artaban joined company with a group of people from his own country, Parthian Jews who had come up to keep the Passover and inquired of them the cause of the agitation and where they were going. We're going, they answered, to a place called Golgotha, outside the city walls. Haven't you heard what happened? Two famous robbers are to be crucified, and with them another called Jesus of Nazareth, a man who has done many wonderful works among the people, so that they love him greatly. But the priests and elders said he must die because he named himself the Son of Man. And Pilate has sent him to the cross because of some claim that he was the king of the Jews. Artaban's heart beat quickly. Could it be the same one who was born in Bethlehem so many years ago? Could it be that this was his opportunity to perhaps ransom the king with his last jewel. Just beyond the entrance to the guardhouse, a troop of Macedonian soldiers greeted this gathering as they flowed out of the gates. As the once still noble magi stood, his regal bearing still evident, paused to look at this troop, he noticed among them a young woman a slave. And as she noticed him, she broke from them and landed at his feet. Have pity on me, she cried, and save me for the sake of God and purity. I also am the daughter of the true religion, which is taught by the Magi. My father was a merchant of Parthus, but he is dead, and I am seized for debts to be sold as a slave. So please save me from this fate. The old conflict sprung up again in Artaban's soul, the same that had come to him in the palm grove of Babylon and on the streets of Bethlehem, the conflict between the quest and the impulse of love, the conflict between the gift he hoped to offer for the king and the real and present need right in front of his eyes. This was the last time he would face this choice. Only one thing was sure to his divided heart. To res rescue the, store, the, the soul in front of him would be indeed a true gift of love. And not, is not love the light of the soul? So he took the pearl from his robes. Never had it seemed so luminous, so radiant, so full of tender, living luster. As he looked at it, a soft and iridescent light full of shifting gleams of blue and rose tumbled upon its surface. It seemed to absorb the reflection of the colors of the lost ruby and sapphire. He took a long look at the last of his treasures, for he 
which he had kept for the king and gave it in ransom for the young woman. As he did so, the darkness of the sky thickened and shuddering tremors ran through the earth. The walls of the house where they stood in the shadows rocked back and forth. Stones were loosened and crashed into the street. Dust clouds filled the air. The soldiers fled in terror. But Artaban and the girl whom he had ransomed crouched helpless beneath the walls of the praetorium. In that instant, he thought, what do I have to fear? What do I have to live for? I have given the last gift away that I had for the king, his tribute. And in that moment, he gave up the quest. It was over. He had failed, but even in that thought, there was a peace. It wasn't resignation. It was not submission. It was something more profound and searching. He knew that all was well because he had done the best that he could. He had been true to the light that had been given him. One more lingering tremor of the earthquake quivered through the ground. A heavy tile shaken from the roof fell and struck Artaban on the temple. He lay breathless and pale with his white head resting on the young girl's shoulder and the blood trickling from his wound. As she bent over him, afraid he was dead, a sound came through the twilight, very small and still, like a music sounding from a distance, in which the notes are clear but the words are lost. The girl turned her head to see if someone had spoken from the window above them, but she saw no one. The old man's lips began to move as if in answer. Clearly he had heard the words as well, and she heard him say in the Parthian tongue, not, not so, my Lord, for when did I see you? When did I see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When? When did I see you an alien and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did I see you sick or in prison and come to you? Thirty-three years I have looked for you, but I have not seen your face, nor ministered to you, my king. And again, the girl heard it, that faint, faraway sound, but now it seemed as though she too understood the words that were being spoken. Verily, I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done unto the least of these, you have also done unto me. A calm radiance of wonder and joy lighted the pale face of Artaban like the first ray of dawn on a snowy mountain peak, and one long last breath of relief exhaled gently from his lips. His journey was ended. His treasures had been accepted. The other wise men had found the king. In the midst of this holiday season, most reflective of times, May you find hope, light, and life in the smallest acts of love and compassion. And remember, the journey is the answer. The answer is the journey. Let's sing together. Closing hymn number 86 in the gray hymnal. Blessed spirit of my life. Help me.
benediction comes from Henry Van Dyke as well. His poem, Time Is. Time is too slow for those who wait, too swift for those who fear, too long for those who grieve, too short for those who rejoice. But for those who love, time is not. Go in peace. Go in love. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.